This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. I have got a great show for you today, but first, let me tell you about today's sponsor, St. John's College. From Greek philosophers who are the wellspring of democratic ideals, to America's founding fathers, to contemporary critics who question everything, each is welcome at St. John's College, where students encounter Adam Smith and Karl Marx, St. Augustine and Friedrich Nietzsche, James Baldwin and Virginia Woolf. Where were you when I was in college? Here, there are no secondary sources, no experts, and no one telling you what to believe. Rather, there are original sources and a community devoted to collaborative inquiry, intellectual humility, and the discomfort that comes from diverse opinions. Explore 3,000 years of human thought on campuses in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Annapolis, Maryland. For master's degree candidates, we also offer studies in the great texts of the East in person or online. Learn more at sjc.edu slash reason. That's sjc.edu slash reason, sjc.edu slash reason. Check out St. John's University. My guests today are Patrick Ruffini, author of Party of the People, Inside the Populist Coalition, Remaking the GOP, and Rui Teixeira, co-author of the book, Where Have All the Democrats Gone? The Soul of the Party in the Age of Extremes. We talk about the 2024 election and who's likely to win the White House, the Senate, and the House of Representatives. We talk about why the working class has become the most important but most neglected part of the electorate. And we also talk about whether or not libertarians have a lot to look forward to in the next couple of years of national politics. Here is The Reason Interview with Patrick Ruffini and Rui Teixeira. Patrick Ruffini, Rui Teixeira, thanks for talking to Reason. Uh, you guys kind of wrote the same book from different sides of the political aisle. Um, Rui, your book is where – which you co-authored with John Judas, Where Have All the Democrats Gone? The Soul of the Party in the Age of Extremes. And Patrick, you wrote Party of the People Inside the Multiracial Populist Coalition, Remaking the GOP. Um, you know, we're less than a month away from the election as we tape this or about a, a month away. Um, I guess let's start with you, Patrick. Uh, you know, one of the arguments in your book is that there is a battle between cosmopolitans and traditionalists or urban versus rural aspects of the GOP. And it all kind of boils down to the idea that the working class roughly defined as people who don't have college degrees are actually very central and important to the flourishing of the GOP or the, the Democratic Party. We'll get to that in a second. Mm -hmm. And that they're starting to move – the working class is starting to move to the GOP. Um, is that holding up? Your book was published about a year ago. Um, is it more true now, less true, or about the same? Well, it's definitely more true than when I started writing the book because when I started writing the book, um, you know, obviously like uh, we had – we'd had the 2020 election. That had happened, but um, what we hadn't had was um, really the electoral implosion of the Democrats under Joe Biden and um, specifically at the start of his uh, uh, 2024 campaign uh, where, um, you know, he was so weak that, you know, he was staring down the possibility of losing one in four African-American voters, perhaps losing the Hispanic vote outright. Now, that wasn't the proximate reason why he yeah. dropped out of the race. Um, but uh, his electoral weakness, particularly among this uh, coalition that Democrats had relied on um, yeah, as recently as 2012, um, was certainly a symptom of, um, you know, that he was a bad candidate. He was a bad candidate even before the debate. And so, uh, you know, there was a switch at the top of the ticket. And um, now I think in many ways, right, I think uh, – Kamala Harris has regained strength with some of those groups, but it's unclear, you know, whether or not um, she will. Uh, it looks like she's still running behind uh, Joe Biden twenty twenty margins among was, those key and groups. And was kind of running behind Hillary Clinton. 
yeah. in many in, in yes, many aspects of Biden the specifically was running behind yeah. Hillary Clinton, but um, but specifically, uh, especially among non-white voters. But the question is, and there's still signs of the polls. Trump is polling ahead of his polling share among black mm-hmm. voters. He's polling ahead of his polling share, uh, not just his polling share, but the, what he actually got in 2020 of his just yeah. share of the vote. Um, so he might get some more undecideds and 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 beat that number. Um, again, so let's let's forget uh, a woman of color, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, somebody who is specifically Two colors, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but somebody who was specifically recruited to join the Democratic right. ticket because she shored up the elements of that coalition, um, that didn't quite work out in 2020, and it might not right. quite work out as well as right. expected in 2024. But I will say she is trying. She has explicitly yeah. made you know, the working class more of a centerpiece right. of her campaign than Joe Biden That, that did. was and, a big theme at yeah. the Democratic National Convention right. where, unconvincingly to my mind, she was pushing herself off as – a representative of the working class. She was raised by a single mom who happens to be a professor emeritus of two Aren't international all the single moms? Race. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, to to bring it to you, Rui, it you know the the book that you and uh, John Judas wrote. You uh, is Kamala Harris the answer to the uh, issue that you see in the Democratic Party, where they've left the working class or non-college educated people behind mm-hmm. or is in favor of uh, you know professionals, women, uh, minorities who re- you write in the book that have replaced blue collar workers over time or is she kind of the worst nightmare of that because she's an ultra kind of cosmopolitan sophisticate. She's changed how she talks now but compared to when she was running for president in 2019, she was to the, she was to the far left it seemed of the San Francisco Board of Education much less the typical Democratic voter. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, it's really more the latter than the former, Mm -hmm. that uh, she is more clearly well-designed to appeal to their already existing strategy Mm -hmm. and the sort of evolving base of the Democratic Party than she is really designed to bring back the working class. And we see that in the polling results. Basically, right now, you look at non-college or working class voters as a whole, she's probably running about 10 points behind Biden in 2020, but she's running ahead among college educated, particularly white college educated voters. So in according to the Catalyst data, which is the best data source, I think, for demographic patterns in previous elections, uh, Biden lost the working class as a whole by four points in 2020. And that was both because he did roughly as bad as they'd been doing among the white working class, and he also lost quite a bit of support in the non-white working class. So that's really what was keeping the Democrats' nose above water in the working class as a whole was, you know, overwhelming support among the non-white working class. That starts to go down, and all of a sudden it's the Republicans nosing ahead among uh, the working class as a whole. So if he lost him by about four points, she's looking like she's more losing him by 12 or 14 points now. So it could be a, you know, another eight or 10 point decline in the Democrats' margin among working class voters as a whole. So Harris clearly isn't doing the job yet. Maybe we'll see what happens in the election. And, you know, it kind of makes sense when you think about it. I mean, she really is not exactly the perfectly designed candidate to appeal to the you know, the toiling masses of America. I mean, she really is a good representative of the liberal professional class, even the liberal professional California class. Really progressive, right? Really progressive. I mean, she tries to walk back some things now. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's famously done that either through her campaign or in some of her speeches, but it's really, it does, it's like rhetoric, right? Nobody, I don't know how seriously people really take it. And of course, the Republicans can dredge up a lot of stuff from her past, put them in commercials and, you know, it's kind of like they would really have to be very aggressive in reinventing her, much more aggressive than they have been to, I think, really convince anyone at this point. So let me ask you guys and uh, Patrick, you go first. You know, if you look at party identification, which is not the same as registration or or ultimate voting patterns, but most of this year, according to Gallup, voter identification has been at near or at or near historic lows for Republicans and Democrats. If the Democrats are losing all of these working class voters and the Republicans are losing all of their college educated voters, um, wh- why are the why are the parties both sinking in identification and self-identification among voters? 
And why are we still at a you know a kind of dead heat, some a couple points below fifty percent for either of these candidates? Well, it's important to distinguish between partisanship and negative partisanship. And what we're seeing right now is uh, you know a, a fever, a negative partisanship at a fever pitch. Why do I bring that up? Because I think that the uh, declining share of uh, partisans in these surveys is is really misleading uh, in terms of in in terms of knowing what's actually going on. Uh, where we have the this is an election with the lowest number of undecided voters, I think by far uh, of any election. I think we've seen. I think it's at three or four percent now. It was at six, and it's it, this has been a trend in decline, but it's really in decline, and it's been it's it, 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 and and very much brought home after the candidate switch, where everybody really seemingly knew which yeah. side they were on. Um, you also see how every single third party candidate has been either muscled out of the race or, or a, a sort of their share. Has, <clears throat> we thought this was going to be a watershed year for third party candidates. Uh, that we does, did? Uh, I thought oh, so. With right? RFK, yeah. RFK yeah. in particular, yeah. okay. in particular yeah. right? Yeah. And, now, you but, may be a partisan of... Uh, uh, Cornell West, or right. yeah, the doctor, <laughs> do, brother Cornell, or brother yeah, Cornell, yeah, but yeah. I don't think he's doctor brother get Cornell. But, no, he's, but I think yeah. in terms of what's going on, uh, it, it, what we are seeing is a is sort of a rise in partisanship. Now, I think negative partisanship in the sense of. I don't think people are maybe willing to identify as much mm -hmm. uh, as a uh, Democrat. Or, I mean, I, mean yeah. I think, but they certainly are acting like right. partisan Democrats yeah. and yeah, Republicans. Yeah. Well, and if you, I mean, it's famously, if you look at the rise of so-called independents, it's right. mostly people who lean toward one party or another, right. but are truly independent, purely independent. Yeah. And right now, in fact, if, right, Patrick, if you look at, you include leaners, that Republicans now actually have a slight That's advantage right. on right. party ID, yeah. which is quite unusual. Yeah, can you, um, uh, you know, you and at, towards the end of uh, Where Have All the Democrats Gone, you and your co-author, you, you come out as kind of, you know, bleeding heart FDR you know, <laughs> epigons. You, you, you know, this is like, oh, if we could only get back to that. But, right, right. I mean, how how can you explain, you know, the Republican Party gaining in that kind of affiliation when they have Trump at the head of the ticket and then people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who was just cryptically tweeting or maybe not cryptically tweeting just the other day, they can control the weather or they control the weather. You know, like who are, who are we kidding? Are you implying she's a little bit off? Uh, you know, just a little. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, I'll speak slower. So in case she's listening. Right, uh, right. No, but um, where where is that coming from? Um, because, you know, I mean, I mean, talk about what what are what's the main mm. reason the Democratic Party seems to be repulsing people these days? Well, I think critical, and we talked a lot about this in our book, is the embrace of by the Democratic Party, the mainstream of the Democratic Party and its associated institutions, um, which we call the shadow party, of a kind of cultural leftism, which is basically pretty much anathema to a lot of working class voters. They just don't have the same views on race and gender and crime and immigration and gender ideology and you know even climate, which has become heavily right. culturized, in my opinion. Um, but there, these are extremely important issues to the Democratic Party mainstream now, to their most loyal, yeah. educated, liberal voters, um, and they wield huge influence in the party. So in a sense, the priorities of the party and its values have moved away from the media and working class voter, and the working class voter is responding. I think a second thing is that the bloom is off the rose and has been for a long time in terms of Democrats' ability to deliver prosperity for ordinary working class people. There's a famous Gallup question that goes back almost three quarters of a century where you ask people, well, okay, which party is going to be better able to keep the country prosperous in the next few years? Prior to the Reagan years, there was like an average 17 point advantage for the Democrats. Mm -hmm. And since then, it's gone back and forth. And now, actually, recently, Republicans have had a pretty solid advantage. So People, working class people don't have this default view, and that's even true now of non-white working, increasingly of non-white working class people. Democrats will deliver prosperity for an ordinary person. Their priorities seem different. I really don't know what they're about. Um, you know, and the Democrats, look, the Democrats have been talking for 40 years plus about the depredations of neoliberalism and how it's like leaving everybody behind. And, you know, for a, a number of working class people at this point is... Well, it's sort of how I feel. So what have you mm. done for me lately? Yeah. And I think just in a very sort of short term or shortish term, you know, you had the Trump years, which were relatively uncomplicated, you know, relatively good economic era and the Biden era for whatever 
however many gonna assess the last year or so has not been that great mm -hmm. as far as a lot of working class people are concerned. What so those two things together, I think, yeah. push a lot of working class to people away focus from the party. a little bit on the uh, the concept of the shadow party, and this is all the the think tanks and interest groups and yeah, whatnot. Advocacy groups, nonprofits. Yeah, and I, I, I was whatever, thinking yeah. earlier today. I saw a tweet from Adam McKay, the um, uh, you know the movie director. Oh, who did like know, the, the weird climate. Yeah, he he, he, he yeah. said, you know, <laughs> any sane government would have declared a climate emergency by now. And I was thinking in, in the context of your book, like the Democrats went from being the party of Archie Bunker to the party of Adam McKay, who's, uh, you know, a limousine liberal who doesn't I know, even – it's completely insane. People do yeah. not walk around in this country – especially working class people thinking there's a climate emergency. This is not that salient right. an issue for them. It's like 15 out of 18 if you ask a long list of issues. Yeah. And they don't, mostly they're concerned about cost and reliability but of energy. How, they don't think of the world in the same way. But to Adam McKay yeah. and people like him, it's like, it's it's part of the air they breathe. They yeah. just believe so strongly Through, that uh, the planet's about to uh, get uh, roasted yeah. that they can't believe any sane person you know, any normal person, so any good th person. That is one, one sign of kind of a progressive extremism that I think most people would be like, yeah, I get it. And mm -hmm. all of us can agree that, you know, the, the, the climate or environmental issues matter. But you, you guys map out in your book about how even the IPCC, which right. is the source of this data, says, oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's really not as bad as you're making it out to be. Mm -hmm. But then how did the Democrats get to the far left of blacks and Latinos who they claim to be representing, mm -hmm. um, who, you know, when, when you look at polls of, you know, blacks and Latinos are much more forgiving, for lack of a better term, of American society. They don't believe that white supremacy is running everything in a way that – like the the extreme part of the Democratic Party, which oftentimes are left, super left, mm -hmm. white progressives. Like, right. how did that sneak in and like pull the party that far well, left? Well, Patrick should speak to this too, but I mean, yeah. there are a lot of moving parts here. There's, you know, where the money come, is coming mm -hmm. from these days. There's the role of primaries. There's the fact that the base, the most loyal base of the Democratic Party, these white college educated voters is just a larger share and white college educated voters you know, sort of the within cell yeah. changes of white college educated voters. They become much more liberal. So, and you know, these institutions, they have huge kind of cultural hegemony. They control the commanding heights of cultural production. I mean, this has a huge influence on how Democrats think about themselves and what they respond to and the signals they're receiving. And they're not receiving the same signals and as strongly from their traditional working class white and non-white base, even the non-white base. I mean, non-white working class voters, they just don't, as loyal as they are and how many votes the Democrats get for them, they just don't exert a huge influence in how, hmm. you know, the Democratic Party thinks about the world and the way it tries to present itself to the world. But Patrick, you, you yeah. probably have some stuff to say about that. Would, uh, well, what do you – what explains, you know, on some level – the uh, you know the Republican Party has evacuated certain kinds of ideas about um, you know economic liberalization, things like free trade, things like open immigration or or more open immigration. Um, but the Republican Party has also gone through a huge change, right? And I mean, this is part of your book of with the rise of Trump and the rise of populism. I mean, somebody like Mitt Romney. He could be in the 1800s rather than, you know, only a decade ago really running as the, uh, the presidential candidate. What, what, what pushed the party in, in an opposite direction for the Republicans? Well, what Trump intuited was that um, swing voters and, uh, you know, voters who decide the election and voters in states like Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and if we're talking about 2016, Ohio, Iowa, don't really care about your tax cut plan, don't really care about uh, really any uh, either right or left-wing ideas of economic philosophy and role of government questions. And these were the animating questions of campaigns in the past. Um, so, um, you know, I think back to 2000 and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, Bush is running on this huge tax cut because that's what you do as a Republican. That's the centerpiece of your fall campaign because Ronald Reagan ran on a huge tax cut and won, you know, a thumping majority. And, and um, that was the lesson people were taking that for, from mm -hmm. that for more than um, 20 years. Um, not only, right, did that type of fiscal, you know, approach became maybe fiscally more unsustainable, not as credible to voters, 
But, um, you know, what you had was, you know, uh, really, uh, you know, Mitt Romney and, you know, John McCain before him, uh, you know, really, we understood them as, you know, more moderate uh, types of Republican candidates, uh, candidates who might do better at appealing to voters in the center of the electorate, uh, were non-threatening personalities, right, too, and and perhaps even in the Obama era, right, um, you know, running a right-wing population against Obama, man, that would have been a really bad contrast given the historic numbers he was racking up with minority voters. But in fact, we cratered with minority voters, obviously with Mitt Romney uh, at the top of the ticket. Barack Obama had had a big, a lot to do with that. But, um, you know, it wasn't um, because, right, and we learn after 2016, <laughs> right, when you substitute one of these mild-mannered establishment Republicans for a loudmouth populist, that he actually does better with voters of colors, not as good as he did in 2020, but better than, than a Mitt Romney did, despite being called a racist uh, by, uh, you know, nonstop. And that's all, that, you know, that was basically the misogyny, racism, that was Hillary Clinton's entire strategy in 2016. And they amplify this so much, but it doesn't have the effect, the intended effect among these voters. And what was really not appealing, right, uh, you know, to those voters about the Republican Party of the past was a party of a rich. It was kind of, you know, seen as the party of the rich. The more you talk about tax cuts, uh, the more Democrats are going to talk about tax cuts for the rich. And that was really not immigration, was what was dragging down the image of the Republican Party among working class voters, not especially non-white working class voters. And Trump was just a better substitute. But fundamentally, he didn't care about these issues, right? That, that wasn't part of his worldview, his philosophy. There are lots of things that are maybe not helpful to him that are part of his worldview and philosophy, and he talks about them in debates, and people have a hard time following a lot of, a lot of, a lot of what he says. Um, but he didn't come in right, with this legacy ideology that, again, voters did not, you know, fundamentally care about. Voters are really focused on what are you doing for them. Yeah. So we're, uh, Rui, and towards the end of the book, you guys did a uh, uh, poll or, 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 or a survey where you asked people whether they agreed with 18 statements. Only one of them had to do with economics or something like that, right? I mean, why? Or I guess. Okay, this was referring yeah. to surveys that have been done. To, okay. Uh, I think one of them was actually done yeah. by AEI, but basically, how do they, how are they determining whether you're liberal or conservative? Okay. And most of the questions, yeah. as you're saying, the overall majority were about cultural issues. Yeah. So, economics. like, but it it seems that the way that you become successful is by appealing to people's economic interests, ultimately, right? Because what you're saying is the reason why. Working uh, working class voters are evacuating the Democratic Party is because they're not delivering economic gains. Part of it, um, you know. How do we get to a place where fundamentally this election does not seem to be about the economy very very much? I mean, uh, Trump can throw out something like, you know, are you better off now than you were four years ago? Which I guess Reagan kind of pioneered that idea, but mm -hmm. it doesn't. Nobody is. You know, they might – both candidates are saying, I'm going to give you a bunch of free stuff. Mm -hmm. But they're not talking with any kind of specificity <clears throat> about actual economic issues. So where – you know, what happened that people get, you know, pulled along by cultural issues rather than economic issues? Well, I mean, in fairness, I mean, it's not like – Voters typically examine the economic policy proposals yeah. of, of candidates very closely anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, if you look at the 2016 Trump election, he did not have very specific economic plans, right. whereas Hillary had a bunch. But he talked a lot about, in very broad terms, about economics, about trade deals, about mm -hmm. factories, about communities getting shattered, about the elites who were you know, basically you know, interested in enriching themselves. He was writing your book for you. Right. Right. Because so, he was talking about the forgotten man. Right. And he was, he was a, and, and that was clearly not only just cultural, though it was yeah. partly cultural, but it was also economic. Right. They don't have your interest at heart. They're doing stuff that hurts you. And I think we're seeing that in this election too. I mean, Trump is not talking about, you know, detailed economic plans, but right. he is talking about how the economy has done under Biden right. uh, and Harrison. That's been bad as far as most people are concerned. And he promises he'll 
you know, make it a lot better. I mean, of course, his plans are not clear. I mean, the thing that, I mean, economics is, is, is certainly, economic policies are important in a somewhat longer term trajectory because what will enable you to govern and get reelected and develop a dominant majority is if you actually deliver for people. They feel like, you know, the upward escalator of American mobility is now working again. You know, the country's, you know, rocking. I mean, I've got opportunities. They feel like things are, you know, prosperity is here. But if you don't deliver that, you can still, you know, rag on the other guy, right? I mean, like Biden, I and mean, a lot of what Trump is running on and the Republicans are running on is people's feeling like the last four years have been not very good in economic and terms. Is it partly because Biden, uh, you know, echoed this? I mean, he's kind of walked it back a little bit, but not so much. But he... He talked about the Green New Deal. You would argue if he was just talking about the New Deal or a New Deal, that would probably be better where it was more focused on kind of kitchen table issues rather than, you know, symbolic issues sure. that would do I mean, well the devil's in the details people. on that. For, but, you know, the Green New Deal was – and even the soft Green New Deal mm -hmm. of the Biden administration was a terrible idea, at least as politics. I'd argue, also argue his policy isn't that great either. But – you know, this was clearly taking a priority of the Democrats and their shadow party and walking it into their economic program and allowing, in a sense, that economic program to be dominated by that. I mean, look at the IRA, for example. Right. I mean, it had actually stuff in it about negotiating drug prices and right. some subsidies for Obamacare, but nobody has any idea any of that happened because it was right. basically seen and not incorrectly as a climate bill. So, you know, even though it was supposed to be out of inflation. Right. Well, of course, right. nobody yeah. took that seriously. Well, how do, <laughs> but, how, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think this is poor marketing on the Democrats' part and poor priority setting on the Democrats' part, but it is nevertheless something they felt compelled to do yeah. because of the you know sort of dynamic that currently drives the party forward. Do you feel, Patrick, as a, uh, as a Republican, um, you know, the, the, are the era of um, castigating your opponent as a big – tax and spend liberal. That's just – that's rhetoric, you know, that might as well have been from the 19th century at this point. Is it just a kind of dead letter ideologically or politically? Uh, it doesn't – the real choices of these campaigns, right, seem to be – I'm surprised we haven't seen more of that. I'm, I'm surprised we have not seen more of uh, Kamala, Kamala is going to increase your tax, right. going to raise your taxes. She's going to send 87,000 IRS agents after you. Right. right? Uh, I, Even I, though I, she's right. also saying I'm not going to raise taxes on anybody. Right. Making four hundred thousand, which it's yeah. that to me is also like, <laughs> the, do people understand how the few toiling masses households, of America yeah, back yeah. under four hundred thousand? And like year. every yeah, yeah. every entitlement bill or giveaway now is like up to people making four hundred thousand dollars a year households, and it's like okay, so you're in the upper the one percent. Middle class is really big. Dude. Yeah, like, it's really very. Big. I think what Trump <laughs> has figured out though yeah. is that the middle class and the working class is not sensitive to taxes and the, particularly the types right. of tax choices that can be made uh, in the type of tax policy that can be made by the president, right? Um, yeah. You know, and what Trump is talking about is, more, you know, no tax on tips and Kamala right. joins him in that, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, so it's, it's uh, you know, away from, uh, you know, sort of this well-designed, well-crafted, immaculately crafted, right. uh, you know, across the board, marginal rate cut mm -hmm. to, okay, we're just going to, you know, uh, yeah, the, we're going to just do this giveaway, that giveaway. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think that that is, uh, you know, it's opportunistic, Certainly, mm -hmm. um, but I think yeah, the old rhetoric, right? This there was there used to be no bigger dividing line in in the final stage of a campaign between you know Democrats are going to raise your taxes and yeah. Republicans are going to cut your taxes right. and you know people ultimately most people like you know at least going back to the Mitt Romney's mm -hmm. forty seven percent comment right. a lot of people aren't paying income tax so right. they're not really sensitive um, to this question. So but then it's just a question of what are you giving me. Right. Yeah, but I think right, it's right. not just what, what are mm. you giving me. And I was trying to take, maybe take a little bit of issue because I think there's been a, a fair amount of debate and discussion on the Democratic side about this so-called question of deliverism, right? Um, so Biden, I believe, I think it was the case, he uh, bailed out the Teamsters pension fund or, mm -hmm. or did something along those lines. And they don't even endorse Kamala Harris. Right, because their members are so. Well, that deal dies with him, right? right? I don't exactly. know. Yeah. Right, but, but they don't even endure. I mean, this is somebody who delivered yeah. for uh, right their interests, their economic interests. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but he's staring, you know, the president of that union spoke at the RNC. He's staring a membership mm-hmm. base that uh, is voting for right. Trump by 20 points. Um, and they're not voting for Trump uh, necessarily because, oh, they've come around or, or Trump has come around to their economic philosophy. Right. It's probably because of cultural issues, right? And so that has been what's dominant. But I don't know that necessarily that people are voting uh, on what benefits mm-hmm. um, people. I think there are some examples of it. I mean, I think people still non-white voters in particular i think we've seen some research that they they credit trump with uh, a lot of the COVID stimulus mm-hmm. the stimulus checks and those types of things um but what they really really don't want is benefits being taken away from them right that is sort of the red flag and that's something that trump i think yeah that was his genius figured out, him right is no i'm not his first thing uh, you know as, as a candidate one of his first things is i'm not like those paul ryan republicans are going to cut your social security benefits right, right? and uh, so sort of excised completely this idea of you know cutting benefits or rebalancing the budget or yeah. or, or doing those things, um, and that's why his his plans overall cost so yeah. much more. And right. I mean by every right. analysis, and it's it's very vague for the reasons you guys have suggested. Neither candidate talks with any specificity, but all of the scoring of Trump's plans versus Kamala's find him spending more and creating, adding more to the debt. But we're not in that world anymore, right? We're, if anybody ever cared about that, certainly now nobody takes seriously the idea that the bill is going to come due and that our kids or our grandkids or whatever machine cyborgs that will inherit our debt will be paying for sometime in the future. What do you do, uh, Rui, a big part of your book, uh, where have all the Democrats gone? You, uh, you, know, you, you mourn the loss of the union, of private sector unions. Um, we have just gone through a weird spasm where for the first time in a long time, people have thought about longshoremen. Uh, you know, um, that seemed to have been a very ugly uh, kind of uh, episode for unions. I don't think unions come out of that looking great. Um, what do you? What is the state of uh, you know of kind of organized labor in the private sector, or does it even make sense to talk about private sector organized labor anymore? And are they going to have any kind of turnaround soon, or is this you know yeah. what we just witnessed is yeah this is kind of the denouement of of something that started declining almost 50, 70 years ago. Yeah, no, I wouldn't hold my breath on this. I mean, private sector unionization at this point is about 6% and falling. Um, I think that if there is to be a revival of the union movement, it would have to be on a basis that is different than the way unions have been thinking about unions. I mean, that there have to be other forms of work organization that could conceivably be uh, assisted by some you know, sort of regulatory overhaul of what's possible. Um, the idea that you have to bargain, you have to basically get a, an all-embracing union certified on a workplace-by-workplace workplace basis is just clearly not going to get you very far in mm-hmm. today's economy. Uh, the basis isn't there for it. You need to move toward, you know, sort of other forms of work organization, the workplace, things that sort of border on sectoral bargaining like they have in a lot of European countries. But the union model, qua union model, that the original NLRB was was set up to deal with um, and that people have traditionally thought of unions, you know, you get the contract and then everybody in the union yeah. and in the shop is in the union. I just, it, were, it was a good thing to have for a while, arguably, but mm-hmm. it's probably not going to happen now on the scale that would actually increase worker power. And that's what we should be concerned about if we believe there needs to be bargaining between uh, workers and, and, and the people who own capital. And that, in fact, there potentially is sort of the, quote, win-win between, mm-hmm. you know, there are ways in which workers can help enhance productivity. Right. And, you know, people who own companies want higher productivity, too. Mm-hmm. So instead of just adversarial bargaining, there must be, could yeah. be bargaining about but, other I mean, things. The, the I, longshoreman, that was, that I mean, that was something out of on the waterfront, right? right? I mean, he was Johnny Friendly saying, we're going to, you know, shut down everything until you give us what I Well, it's we huge want, pay right? raise and we don't want any automation. I think yeah. the future of that kind of union doing that kind of bargaining is probably not good. Yeah. And I think, you know, Oren Cass at American Compass, yeah. his, his group has a lot of interesting ideas about, you know, potential And by interesting, you mean terrible, <laughs> Right. 
Terrible? Yeah. Uh, well, I, let me say, if you say interesting, I say terrible. But oh, I, okay. Yeah, well, no. so you're not you're not a big fan of American Compass. Or, no, why is no. that? Uh, because it's backward thinking and it's protectionist. Uh-huh. It's been tried and it failed. Oh, you just I don't think. like the tariffs, right? Uh, uh, among other things. Among yeah, other yeah. things. Okay. Well, you but know, I think this actually yeah. is is pertinent to this discussion. Absolutely. Because I yeah. think that. The way the Republican Party is evolving, yeah. it's more moving. Yeah. And, you know, if there's policy bones to be put on the populist. Oh, you know, it is of, totally the American I mean, these are people uh, who are thinking model, about yeah. and have ideas. Yeah. And I think they're, they're ascendant to some yeah. extent within the Republican Party. Because otherwise, what's, I mean, I think the people who yeah. have a more traditional approach to economics, uh, including some of my colleagues at AEI, I just right. think they're, you know, they don't really... They, Whatever, if there can be a synthesis within the party of sort yeah. of the national conservatives and the freedom conservatives, right? It's not clear what it is yet. Oh, I don't think yeah. there can be really. And maybe not, be, but yeah. I mean, this is this is yeah. the this is a real world Republican Party today. Yeah, and maybe some of Warren Cass's ideas are terrible. I mean, no, I'm, well, and it's kind but, of fascinating. You know, there's to, gonna they're going to have an influence to think about him as a Mitt Romney guy and now espousing right. you know something that sounds much more kind of like an FDR style. Yeah, you know, it's like a conservative yeah. FDR. I mean, and he are, yeah. he also had an interesting piece the other day about under forty and over forty right. conservatives. That there's a yeah. real generational split. Yeah, that is uh, looking at what I, I wanted to bring that up in the context of unionism because it's also true that the longshoremen, like the auto workers and other things, they're really pl- playing as much as anything else a generational game where younger workers come in and they get much, you know, they get lower pay and they mm-hmm. get less benefits, and they are paying for the older generations you know, kind of gold-plated uh, benefits that were, you know, from decades ago. That's kind of broadly true in American society where younger people are paying into old age entitlements that, are, you know, are almost certainly not going to be there, at least in the same form when they retire. How does that play out in the Republican Party, um, Patrick? Or, or has that shown up yet in this kind of populist republicanism? Uh, populist from the standpoint of, uh, I mean, I think where where it has shown up mm-hmm. has been on the other side of it, where Trump, you know, again, like very first thing, he very first thing out of the gate, the way he distinguishes himself from other Republicans is saying, I'm not going to cut your Social Security. Right. And let's throw. And, uh, to be fair, none of them were even Paul Ryan were never going to do that. They were always like right, a way right. off in the distance. We're going to. But he was talk happy about to indulge yeah. kind of the Democratic yeah. talking points. That, right. You know, uh, said Paul Ryan was going to throw Grandma off the cliff. Yeah. Right. And so. And I, depending I think, on the grandma, that could right. be an absolutely valid choice. But uh, you know, it's interesting, right? Because that was very yeah. much the electorate that mm-hmm. elected Trump, perhaps, and yeah. it was really kind of the electorate that existed when uh, Trump came to the scene. But, um, you know, if you believe the polls this year, it's a much younger Republican electorate that you do have a realignment, um, perhaps among especially young men. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, I'm not uh, I, I'm not going to say that because of entitlement policy or anything mm-hmm. that he said on any economic issue, but it, it does seem that like, um, in particular, that because the uh, young younger generation have been the losers in right. the current economy. Particularly that, um, young men. Right, young men in particular, right, that they've been the losers. And particularly non-college educated young men. Exactly, right. right. And, you know, and they're the majority. I mean, you know, you you have this, obviously, um, uh, you you know, you've got uh, a lot of work out of AEI on the gender gap and particularly Mm -hmm. the Gen Z gender gap in particular. But but a lot of what's behind that is that you have young women who are going to college in record numbers and young Mm -hmm. men aren't following them. And and so that's what you see driving this uh, increasing increasing divide. But in terms of, um, you know, in terms of the, 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 the generational appeal, a populism to younger voters. I think we're seeing, we're starting to see it now in 2024, in particular, and, and you know, be very interested to see, you know, in, uh, you know, a month from now, what the exit polls say mm-hmm. young voters did, but what particularly what young minority voters did, because they are the voters who, you know, are not um, particularly in, uh, you know, in non-white communities, they're not as aligned with the de- mm-hmm. traditional Democratic Party. Um, right. The Democratic number is holding up pretty well among older black voters, um, but it's, it's much uh, much attenuated among younger mm-hmm. black voters. Um, so I think that there's a lot of issues uh, that are driving these voters uh, towards Trump specifically. I'm not mm-hmm. saying they're being driven towards the Republican Party. I'm saying they're being driven towards Trump right. because of um, you know a situation, the economic situation specific to uh, the Biden years. 
but um, but um, I, I think we we are seeing a little bit of a you know a refashioning of that populist coalition as we head into this election. Before we continue with the recent interview, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Zbiotics. This is a game changing product that you can use before a night out. Do you think you need to make a choice between having a great night or a great next day? Zbiotics might make a huge difference for you. Zbiotics pre alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists. Here's how it works when you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in your gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme that breaks this byproduct down. All you have to do is remember to make Zbiotics your first drink of the night and then drink responsibly. Try it out and see a difference the next day. I don't drink, but I'll tell you what, a friend of mine who does recently cracked open Zbiotics when we were out. And I said, hey, does it work? She told me, yes, it really works. Go to zbiotics.com slash TRI to get 15% off your first order. Use that code zbiotics.com slash TRI at checkout. TRI stands for the reason interview. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money without asking any questions. Once again, head to zbiotics.com slash TRI and you're going to get 15% off at checkout. Now, back to the Reason interview. Does it kill you, Rui, as a, as a Democrat, the idea that Donald Trump, a billionaire, and what, he'll be the second or third oldest president to get reelected if he gets elected, that he's stealing the younger vote and that he's stealing, you know, and obviously in air quotes, but he's stealing young people's votes, he's stealing minority votes, things that had been kind of part of the Democratic coalition. Yeah, well, no, it is kind of annoying, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll confess. But, uh, you know, I think that this is part of what we wrote about in the yeah. book. I mean, to some extent, the Democrats are being hoisted by their own petard. Mm -hmm. um, yes, they are losing voters in these demographics. Yes, their image is not what it should be among these demographics to uh, keep them uh, within the party, within the coalition, and to build up their coalition. But they've made choices. Mm -hmm. They are you know, dominated by forces, other demographics within the party that push them in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. and they have not pushed back. You know, they're, they're, you know, searching for the soul of the party in an age of extremes, our subtitle. Yeah. What is the soul of the Democratic Party now? It used mm -hmm. to be, you know, the party of the working class, you know, sort of the heritage going back to the New Deal. It's much less clear now what the soul of the party is. It's a soul of the party, you know, committed to this vision of a wonderful multicultural you know, multiracial mm -hmm. America where everybody is liberal about pretty much everything and that everybody's going to wind up going to college and become a professional? Or well, what is it about? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's a real problem with these, you know, particularly the younger parts of these demographics. It's like they don't really look at the Democratic Party as default their party, as a party they know has their back. They, you know, are sort of stand for policies. You know, I get it. That's more or less what I need. Hmm. I don't think that's the situation today. And in fact, I think it connects to something we were raising earlier about why aren't things fought on macro budgetary and economic policy hmm. terms as much as they used to be. I think it's because partly because both parties default models in those buckets have hmm. really nobody has much faith in either side at this right. point. The standard Republican approach is standard Democratic approach. I think people is like, eh. You know, yeah. especially as a young person, what do you really have to offer me? Well, and certainly the Republican Party, I read a lot about this in the earlier part of the century, which it still seems odd talking about the century. But I mean, Bush was terrible in terms of spending. I mean, he came in saying he was going to, you know, balance budgets and all of that. But he, he increased spending, you know, faster than anybody than LBJ. Mm -hmm. And no, nobody's looked back since then. I mean, nobody's seriously trying to balance a budget or do anything like that. Um, in terms of the generations, is are we conceivably on the cusp of a new alignment? That is, you know, where you're essentially saying younger, 
Younger populations that normally would have voted Democratic don't feel any affinity towards it. Or less affinity. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and that's actually true because even if even if young black men are voting in higher numbers for Republicans, it's still probably like one out of four, right? Um, and um, but is are we is it that the kind of 20th century model? I mean, you talk about the New Deal, and then you also talk about you know FDR's Second Bill of Rights, which was a big part of LBJ's legacy, and that extends through even people like Bill Clinton, even as he was redefining the Democrats, he was mm -hmm. still in that tradition. Like, is it just that all of this 20th century talk, including you know on the Republican side, Reagan, uh, you know Reagan, and talking about communism and stuff like that's just that's the past now, and we need. We want something different, and it's going to shake out more on, you know, populist terms, whether it's Republican or Democrat, where it's you don't worry about the price tag of stuff, but you're protecting people, you're protecting America from mm -hmm. immigrants, and I want to talk about them in a minute, mm -hmm. but or economic dislocation, which and anxiety. Everybody seems anxious, whether it's about the environment or about whether or not your job is going to be around much longer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have a Democratic Party that, in some sense, does just not seem aware. Uh, that this legacy even exists existed anymore, right? Um, in terms of you know, certainly not in terms of um, uh, you know what Harris is appealing to right now, which is a campaign heavily focused on let's say abortion and really uh, re uh, you know reclaiming or you know she has freedom up on on yeah. stage at all of her rallies. I the found only that like, kind of great, interesting. Actually. Right? I mean, but, I, I don't know. But what, like, what does it represent? It, yeah, right. Is freedom yeah. eighty seven thousand IRS agents? Like, what aspects yeah. other than that one? Well, issue? it might be being able to yeah. decide whether or not you want to terminate an unwanted pregnancy. Right. That's right? one. If, that's know. the one yeah. thing, right? So it's bodily. Yeah. The, these ideas of yeah. bodily freedom, right, are, yeah. are are prominent, and maybe in twenty twenty. That was true with COVID and right. uh, Republicans. Now, that was yeah. a losing debate back then probably, but was right. not so much of a losing debate in 2021 and 2022 when Republicans were able to gain um, some key state governorships on that issue. But I think you're right. I mean, I think – and I think it's, it's, this ties back to the idea – that I write about a little bit um, and it's, it's just kind of this basically pretty boring idea is we all got richer, right? I mean, right. in the last 30 years, the, the number of – uh, you know, and you look at particularly the poverty rate among African Americans, Hispanics. I mean, um, uh, not to say everything is great, but right. it is, I think, but in many ways, a transformed community that has enabled these types of shifts. Yeah. And so, as, what, as a result of what, um, you don't have a Thomas Frank anymore going around and writing mm -hmm. about. You know, it's the, the the most basic thing we know about these political parties is that Democrats are the party of the downtrodden, mm -hmm. right? Because that idea in and of itself seems anachronistic because people, number one, there's far fewer objectively downtrodden people in mm -hmm. the in the country, and so the political upside of appealing to those mm -hmm. types of, of, of those types of voters is a lot less, and nobody wants to think of themselves right in those mm -hmm. terms. Um, so the idea is like as we become more prosperous, it all becomes about cultural issues. Right. It all becomes it's about all cultural symbolic. debates. It's symbolic politics because it's, uh, you know, and even the, you know, even to some extent the working class voter, right, right. has a little bit more, you know, leeway in terms of, uh, you know, basing their politics around those issues when it, there isn't really the struggle to survive that we saw in, you know, the immediate post-war period, yeah. right, that, um, that, you know, when that, that appeal was quite potent. <clears throat> I, you know, one of the things that your book does, and I hadn't thought about him in a while, and it, uh, William Julius Wilson, the mm -hmm. uh, you know the great sociologist who ended his career talking about uh, was it the truly the truly disadvantaged, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and it's interesting because the the truly disadvantaged who are people who don't have any you know you know much of anything, any any social, political, cultural capital, uh, you know, nobody gives a shit about them anymore, right? Well. I think you can make that argument. I mean, I, I, you know, if a loyal Democrat was here at the table, they'd probably yeah. say, well, what do you mean? You know, we're trying to fight racism. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to, you but know, But as you point out uplift. in your book, like, so that meant that during, like, COVID lockdowns and stuff, the San Francisco school board was trying to rename the schools that were named for people yeah, like I mean, it, Diane it, it, Feinstein. It's a lot of emphasis yeah. on performative and symbolic yeah. gestures on rhetoric, even right. the language people use as a substitute for actually yeah. improving the material situation of the truly disadvantaged, mm. right. which is pretty bad, right? Yeah. Still in America, despite the fact we've gotten richer. I mean, you know, 
black poor people who live in urbanized areas, they still have a really hard life and they live in crime ridden communities. And they, they live in a, a kind of area where a lot of people have weak attachment labor market. I mean, young right. men are doing terribly. There's a lot of drug addiction. I mean, how do you deal with that? That's really well, should be the yeah. issue, right? And it's not the idea that you could like, you're solving this in any way by saying America is a white supremacist right. society and we have to struggle against racism is completely unresponsive to right. the situation. But the nature of the Democratic Party today is there's a lot of buy-in to that kind of perspective. Right. What really animates your you know, upper middle class liberal right. <laughs> activist, right? White activist. I mean, it's like, it's racism. It's, you know, for an abortion. It's yeah. like, we must stop the terrible scourge of climate change. Right. But, you know, when it gets down to the actual lived experience, I can use a terrible yeah. term, of the people who really need, you know, need a better life. Yeah. It's just not there. They're not as excited about it. Oh, I, sure, they'll give lip service to it, but they're not that excited about it. There's an interesting study that was done by Suresh Naidu and all some economists about how the Democrats' rhetoric changed from the 80s onward. They used to be more concerned with sort of jobs and economic uplift and prosperity and economic growth. And, you know, over time, that a lot of that really faded away. Uh, you know, yeah. to the point where we have a Democratic Party today, which is just much more animated by other things. Again, they'll still check those other boxes, right. but it's a question of what's the relative salience within the Democratic Party. Yeah, because I, I mean, I thought that was actually Trump in 2016 had a pretty good point when he would talk to black audiences or address them, usually in the most kind of dumb, vulgar way. But he would say, you know, you you know your Chicago has been controlled by Democrats forever, and what have they done for you? And they really right. haven't delivered. It's not that he necessarily has tailored options for them, but it's like you know that's it's not a bad call out, really. Sure. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, people are always asking me and other people, uh, people who analyze politics, how can it be the case these people are voting for Trump in greater numbers? How is that even possible? I mean, if you look at sort of blue city governance, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of these places yep. like Chicago. Why isn't the question the reverse? Why aren't more people yeah. voting for the other side? I mean, if this is what Democrats have to offer, people live in you know, places like that and yeah. you know, urban areas uh, of our country where they have essentially one party rule, you know, I mean, it's, it's amazing more people are so affected. Let me, let me turn this around a little bit, Patrick, to you and Republicans. If, the, you know, Democrats are captives of their most extreme version of themselves, a cartoon version of themselves, isn't it the case that the Republicans should be doing so much better, but especially since Trump emerged, they are nominating some of the dumbest fucking people you can imagine. Uh, you know, when, when you look at the, you know, the, the Senate races in Georgia, where there are two walkover, all you have to do is lay up. Somebody has put a ladder under the basket, just put the ball through the hoop, and they're like, okay, we're going to nominate Herschel Walker, you know, and lose a safe seat and things like that. And, you know, there's people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, Carrie Lake, like, like the, Lake, yeah. the Arizona Republican Party is somehow, you know, they're like a bunch of Buddhist monks or something. They're lighting themselves on fire. They're so bad. Um, is that going to be reined in in any kind of – meaningful way or does it not matter because it's symbolic and you know the people they might uh, that might be electing them can live with that and you know if republicans do win they will have win despite they're winning despite themselves let's be let's yeah. be honest about it mm -hmm. right and uh, but i think i think what this speaks to is i i think that the um uh, you know complete lack of interest i think either party has right now in winning big like yeah. winning a mandate, winning right. um, because, look, the entertainment value certainly of close elections is uh, a lot, you know, certainly a lot higher, a lot more suspenseful. Yeah. Um, but also, I think the very practical, uh, tangible reason for this is uh, Republicans have learned primary election after primary election that um, if you are seen as somebody who will sell out the base in some way, right? Because you go back to that George W. Bush era, I remember people were so angry, right? And I served, uh, you know, in his administration, I served and did, uh, you know, did work uh, 
you know, on his campaign. And I remember people in that second term were so angry and they would say, we're, we're really, really angry about the spending. But you know what they were hmm. really angry about was immigration. And yeah. the fact that he was a, a president who was moving to the center on immigration right. policy in, in a meaningful way. He had openly Johnson campaigned Maine. on it. Yeah, campaigning so on like it, it uh, and yeah. working with John McCain and Ted Kennedy yeah. on a comprehensive immigration bill, and that's the that's the you know kind of the spark that lit the fuse of mm. Trumpism, right? Because it really a generation, and you go fast forward to the twenty twelve election. Um, they lose that election, and immediately the knee-jerk reaction among the Republican establishment is, uh, we're losing all these Hispanic voters. What are we going to do to get these Hispanic voters? Uh, we're going to sign on to comprehensive immigration reform, Yeah. right? Um, and that's that. That's the thing. That's going to win us these Hispanic voters. Fast forward 12 years, uh, Republicans are winning record numbers of Hispanic voters on a mm -hmm. platform of mass deportation. Yeah. Um, so that's not it, right? That wasn't it. But the, 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 the anger, the seething anger that that created within the Republican base, that this was at every juncture, that what the uh, Republican, the weak-kneed Republican establishment mm -hmm. was going to do to them, uh, you know, created the opportunity for them to do something, um, you know, just, uh, you know, kind of say, all right, uh, we're just going to throw the one last Tail Mary pass yeah. here with Trump uh, and nominate and do something so extreme, so unthinkable, so they finally get the message. Um, what they didn't, what I think a lot of people didn't bank on that was that this would actually prove to be somewhat of a successful formula yeah. for winning a national election. So uh, yeah. talk, and I, I want to come to you in a second about this. In immigration, you know, by every indication, and I realize I, you know, I, I am pro-immigrant. I don't, I don't believe in open borders. I think that's, it is a canard, but I believe that there should be more legal immigration than there is and that, you know, and we should... Make it as easy as possible for come here to you know to live and work here peacefully and lawfully. All of that, you know, immigrants, in, including illegal immigrants or maybe especially immigrants, you know, they take less welfare, they commit less crime. But immigrants are the flashpoint in this election. I mean, you know, it's always the economy, but people really immigration has risen to a level. What is the symbolic? kind of meaning of immigration here? Um, and what is what are the anxieties that are, are being projected onto immigrants? And why is that such a flashpoint right now, do you think? Um, I think it goes back to, I mean, to some extent, if you want a unifying theory, it's, you know, this good, you know, it, 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 to the extent of, uh, you know, it's the old democratic slogan, you never had it so good, right? Mm -hmm. But to the extent that um, people feel like, you know, they, they have become, you know, people don't necessarily feel that way. Um, people are just much more loss averse. And then, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that they feel like, you know, it, 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 there's very easily kind of this mindset of, um, you know, people coming in, they're just going to take our jobs. And there's mm -hmm. just so much uh, this ingrained belief, right? That they are, in fact, you know, you've just recited stats yeah. and facts. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, th there's an ingrained belief that people are coming here and taking benefits and are only coming here for the welfare benefits. And that's, the, yeah. this is just, I, I think that is just one thing. Uh, you're just not going to talk <laughs> a lot of people out of. Um, yeah, for sure. And, but you, you don't necessarily. I, I, I do think what approximately what people are responding to is these images of disorder uh, on the border. This mm -hmm. out of control, like the, uh, the sense that the yeah. situation is just out of control, and the leadership uh, at the national level mm -hmm. has absolutely no ability uh, to bring right. this situation under control. Um, back, go back to 2016 when Trump was ranting and raving about immigration, immigrants. Um, you had majorities who uh, were against it, and you, in fact, had record numbers uh, saying we need to bring more immigrants into the country. Um, but Democrats attempting to, you know, kind of misreading that as open borders or, or right. seeing some sort of political benefit in uh, rescinding all of the Trump era immigration policies. Um, created this situation, then now we have record low numbers of people saying we need to bring more right. le immigrants legally into the country. Yeah, Rui, you talk about in uh, Where Have All the Democrats Gone, of, I guess it was in 2019, where all of the major candidates uh, ritually acknowledged that they wanted to decriminalize yeah. the border, yeah, right, right. et cetera. Hands, yeah. So it's, a, it's, I mean, part of it is immigration. It's those images of the southern border. Nobody, nobody's worrying about people sneaking across, you know, from uh, 
uh, Fort Erie into Buffalo or I something worry about like that. that. Those yeah. Canadians, you got to uh, keep an eye on them. Yeah, they, you know, they, and they repatriate money and that weird currency and everything. No, but it, I mean, is it mostly, is it part of like part of what you talk about in the book is that, uh, and, and, you know, and I'm, I'm on the opposite side of a lot of the arguments that you're making with mm-hmm. things that like NAFTA and the World Trade Organization <laughs> mm-hmm. and that globalized trade hollowed out the American heartland and whatnot. But you look at that you know, those images of chaos at the border and of people just kind of streaming across, that this plays into populist fears, that this is just sure. a country that no longer means anything and we can't protect what we have, much less grow what we have. Is that where, you know, the fixation on immigration is coming from? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot of it. I mean, the, um, I mean one thing is if you look back on the democratic history on the immigration <laughs> issue, it wasn't that long ago. But Democrats were much more hawkish on the uh, border. Bill, Bill Clinton the in Jordan 96. You, and so yeah, on. Yeah. I mean, basically, you know, large-scale immigration was viewed as a way of undercutting unions in the mm-hmm. low-wage labor market. I mean, which makes sense, right? You increase supply, you know, unskilled workers, it'll have an yeah. effect. But so, uh, you know, but that changed a lot over time yeah. to the point where Democrats increasingly became dominated by the view that – you know, no human being is illegal. If people come over and they are illegal, well, we'll just have to figure out a way to give them citizenship. And to even talk about border security was sort of borderline racist. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, you had the thing when, uh, you know, Biden came into office where they basically rescinded all the Trump restrictions and they basically sort of, w- w- you know, waved their hands mm-hmm. at, you know, this sort of in, uh, sort of surge of people across the border. They, there were all kinds of ways in which they gained the asylum system. Mm-hmm. Biden used the parole program. That's how all the people wound up in Springfield, Ohio. I mean, it was it was kind of open season on getting into the United States. It wasn't exactly a secret. The cartels used it. People heard about it through social media. So none of this sits well with people who feel like their lives haven't been going that well and that this seems like an indulgence of people who don't really belong in this country over you know, my life. But I just wanted to take it back yeah. to, to was something that uh, Patrick was saying about, doesn't anyone really want to win big, mm-hmm. right? I mean, if you think if you were the Democratic Party that was pro-immigration, you'd figure out a way to like move toward, you know, more legal immigration, maybe a way of at least yeah. legalizing some of the people in the country, but really cracking down on border security and really assuring people that if people come into the country, they come in in the right way. And we're not just going to give people aw- stuff away to people. We're not going to allow right. people to game the asylum system. On the Republican side, you could you also make some sort of an argument like that, except really maybe a little bit more on the border securities. But instead of sort of demonizing immigrants, we're just talking about how horrible they are. I mean, there is a sweet spot there, I think, for yeah. both parties. You, you might want to try to hit if if you wanted to win big, as opposed to just appealing to the you know, yeah. base in the Re- Democratic Party who think immigration is great and the only people who don't like it are racist. And, you know, people in the Republican Party who think all immigration is basically a terrible idea. Well, um, is, so, is this partly, you know, for most of the 21st century, there, you know, the control of the White House and the two houses of Congress have been kind of yeah, ping-ponging back, back and forth. And forth. This is like, it's, and even when, even now, I mean, it's, it's very bitter equilibrium split. between the parties. Yeah, and nobody, nobody really seems interested in saying like, oh, you know what, there, there were – periods in our lifetime, not right. even like ancient history, where mm. you might control Congress for 40 years or something like that. Everybody's just happy to make it through a midterm. They also, I think, don't you think, Patrick, a lot of, at least the, the more fervent elements of both parties believe they're this far away from the big yeah. election that will... Right. Yeah. But, I, but I think particularly in the Republican Party, it's, uh, you know, if you go out, if you go for that big win... You're seriously endangered in the primary, and uh, you know I right. think that that's probably a little bit less of a oh, threat because it's centrist or, right. or it's I perceived mean, you're as too moderate. moderate, right? Uh, yeah. And so if you yeah. are Nikki Haley, right, you yeah. can appeal to the center of the electorate. Well, good luck getting through a Republican primary right. where you have somebody like what, Donald Trump. I was speaking to that. How, how did how did you feel when you you know when JD Vance in the vice presidential yeah. debate couldn't you know he's kind of a smart guy. I mean he went to Ohio yeah. State. He lost some of IQ points at Yale Law, but like <laughs> when he had oh, to say, on, when he had to say, you know, like, oh no, Trump, you know, Trump obviously won the 2020 election. Like, there's, 
something well, insane going on. didn't exactly say that. It was a little bit more weaselly. But, yeah. yeah. No, he wasn't, I mean, wasn't going to contradict the boss, but that's for sure. It's kind of nuts, right? Yeah. Where it's like, you know, you... Well, I'm surprised Democrats haven't done more to capitalize on this, frankly, because, I mean, I mean the idea that, like, all right, we're sitting here, uh, you know, and you, you talk about an issue where... Uh, you know, uh, and, and, and you know, it's not a, it's not a major election. We're sitting right. here on October seventh, right? right? And yeah, um, you think you would think it would be the easiest thing in the world for you know a Democrat or yeah. any anyone sitting in the White House to simply, you know, stand with Israel because I mean that you know you look at any poll and uh, you know vast major, vast yeah. vast majority of people um, say they side with more with Israel than they do uh, with the Palestinians yet. Um, you know, all the energy, right, in the Democratic Party right now or all the, you know, everything that she, uh, Kamala Harris feels that she needs to say really is is very trying to tiptoeing around, right, this issue, right, uh, because, you know, they fear, right, um, you know, I, I think they're, both parties to some extent are living in fear of elements mm -hmm. of their base turning on them. And yeah. I, I don't necessarily think that's a warranted fear in a general right. election. I mean, let's, yeah, you can clean up the mess later. But that is, kind of it's like, kind but, of fascinating that, yeah. uh, you know, I remember when Trump started going back out to run for re-election and a couple of times he trotted out at, at big rallies, like the idea that he had authored, you know, or Operation Warp Speed yeah. and the vaccines, no. like they were his and people were booing him. Yeah, right, so he doesn't right. talk about it anymore. Right. It's both kind of, it's humorous and kind of funny, but also kind of creepy that these yeah. parties are so terrified of their own bases. It's like a Twilight Zone episode where the kid can, you know, like kill you with a look or something like that, right? Yeah, in a way, it, it gets to why aren't there elements in both parties that are willing to face down. It's a little bit more yeah. obvious in case of Republican Party because it's really hard to go against Trump. Yeah. But in the Democratic Party, you'd think if someone would be out there who thinks, hey, we can we can wait big. The Trumpified Republican Party is really weak. Yeah. If we just move to the center, you know, on A, B, and C, right. and we take this approach and that approach, we can really kick their ass. Yeah. But it's not like not obvious to me who those elements are within the Democratic Party today. Certainly not of well-known politicians. Do you think, Patrick? Or no, I mean, I think uh, uh, you know, I think I think uh, you know, certainly if you see a non-Trump Republican primary next time, which mm -hmm. I think he, he said he's not Run running, hopes. we'll see, we'll yeah. see, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. But uh, but uh, but uh, you know, I think it, it, it's more open to the possibility because yeah. he is not, um, you know, he, but he is certainly. I think the reason why, you know, certainly the reason why that he, um, you know, has risen to this position in the party where you literally cannot go against him. Hmm is because he resolved that psychodrama going back uh -huh. to the Bush era where, you know, Republicans simply cannot trust. It feel like they cannot trust the, the people that they elect to actually represent them. But they trust Trump implicitly on that. Yeah. I mean, he's the first person they've ever put forward any uh, any uh, any any anywhere uh, any Republican has been nominated anywhere uh, where the base just absolutely trusts him implicitly to advocate for their interests, even when he's throwing in the pro-lifers under the bus, mm -hmm. even when he's saying, oh, let's give green cards out to the, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, to you know, to the, the foreign degree. students, yeah, yeah. right? I mean, it, it just all of these things that go against what they say their core beliefs are, right? right? But um, mm -hmm. because he's Trump, because he's somebody, again, who fights and you know where he yeah. stands, right? I, 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 it is impossible, right, to go against him. And by the way, these MAGA candidates, the Mark Robinsons of the world, yeah. think they can recreate it. They can't because <laughs> no they kidding. don't have his personality. They don't yeah. have what he has. Um, and it's not about any of the positions he takes. It's about the the style, uh, right, that he projects. And you mean the very psycho Trump <laughs> kind of personality that drives liberals nuts is, is really one of his superpowers, right? Oh, yeah. Because to a media and working class voter out there, they fucking hate these scripted candidates. Yeah. They just think they... Republican or Democrat, they never say anything they themselves really mean. Right. And you cannot accuse Trump of that. He says lots of stuff. He clearly yeah. means, and if, you know, and he goes from one subject to another, often tangents. Yeah. I mean, he's a completely undisciplined, unscripted right. candidate. Yeah. And to some extent, but people But probably love that. not able to be replicated. 
Probably uh, not. Yeah, and it's a problem. Soon. Yeah. So he might yeah. just be like a bad meal passing through the digestive system or something. But he's permanently changed the party, as, as Patrick yeah, wrote about. Yeah, or certainly blood. fractured. Yeah. Um, so uh, before I, I want to hold, I want to have you guys make predictions in a second. But first, yeah. you know, because this is reason, and like I'm, I look back, you know, a dozen years, and it's like the, literally the New York Times Magazine. Uh, had a cover story saying, has the libertarian moment finally arrived? And this was something, you know, myself and my colleagues have Sorry been working that, at. Brother. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> well, you know, it's the New York Times. What did they know, yeah. right? But, you know, it did seem as if uh, people were fed up with government mm -hmm. or, or, you know, they, they, you know, the l amount of trust and confidence in government has been going down and down. And between uh, Bush and Obama, you know, whose lie of the year was about, you know, if under Obamacare, if you liked your doctor, you could keep your doctor. He was bad on foreign policy. The economy wasn't doing that well, et cetera. It seemed like the idea of, you know, being socially tolerant and fiscally responsible was in the air. Is there anything in the current political, you know, moment that speaks to libertarians? Because, you know, it does seem Trump, you know, or right now, Kamala Harris is going to keep in place all the tariffs that Joe Biden left in place that Trump had put in place. And then Trump is promising, you know, as much as 60 percent higher uh, tariffs on Chinese goods and things like that. Immigration is totally off the board. Uh, drug legalization seems to have kind of petered out on some level. Um, you know, a, a variety of free speech issues. Both Trump and Harris talk about how we got to get rid of misinformation or we have to control certain types of you know social media and things like that. Is there you know what happened to the libertarian impulse in the body politic? Rui, you go first. Oh, um, well, I, I think you guys are in kind of tough shape, to yeah. be honest. I mean, I think the constituency out there for traditional libertarianism is just, is just not high at this point. I mean, you can look at, a, I mean, there are little signs like, you know, a lot of people who are at Niskanen used to be at Cato, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the formal libertarian movement has splintered. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it really did have a, a certain base in the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. At least you could look at the sort of general economic philosophy and say there's a family resemblance to, right. to what libertarians believe in. And I, you know, clearly that's not the ascendant strain today mm -hmm. in the Republican Party. And the Republican Party has moved away from, uh, and certainly Trump has moved yeah. away from, I mean, a lot of the things that define the more free marketish elements. Yeah, talking about things Party. like industrial policy and things right, like now that. Right, now it's just, I mean, it's not so. whether industrial policy is which kind. Now, yeah. I may think... That's a good thing, right, clearly right, as a libertarian. Yeah. Yeah. You don't think it's a good thing, but I think that's the reality. That's where we are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know what to tell you. I guess you guys are going to, you know, continue to be the, the wonderful gadflies you are. I guess so. But, uh, Patrick, is there a place where, you know, the pilot light can uh, become a roaring bonfire to make a really uh, bad I'm metaphor? no more optimistic about this. And I think that um, par partly uh, due to... You know, I mean, back in 2016, right, um, you know, we were still in that post-2012 autopsy period in the mm -hmm. Republican Party, and I think um, both um, sides really conceived uh, that there is going to be a new demographic majority in mm -hmm. the country that's going to be some combination of minority, you know, non-white voters rising as a share of the mm -hmm. population, but also, as you talk about, really, in the emerging democratic majority, the professional class, mm -hmm. really yep. coming of age and being a, a much bigger part share and part of the electorate um, than, it is, than, it, than it is and um, than it actually turns out to be. Um, hmm. and, and their influence obviously being very strong in the Democratic Party, but actually being, you know, white voters without college degrees are just three in 10 voters in mm -hmm. the country. And when you actually look at public opinion, the virtually the only people who have very highly consistent, ideological views on either the right or the left, um, where their social issue views match mm -hmm. up with a certain economic philosophy, um, that is just dramatically more prevalent among whites with a college degree, mm -hmm. who are a tiny, dem not tiny, but yeah. uh, still significant, very influential, 
but a permanent minority in the country. And as the as the sort of our conception of politics has shifted to there is a working class supermajority who believes just very different things mm-hmm. on both the right and the left than the uh, you know kind of the uh, you know people who have college degrees mm-hmm. who run all the institutions who basically mm-hmm. run the country who are ninety five percent of Congress. Um, and so that is uh, I think it particularly transformed the Republican Party who really really depends. Uh, on the majority of their votes from people who ha- who don't have college degrees and are really ascendant among those people. So what are their views, right? Their views, I don't think, are necessarily either on the far left or on the far right. Uh, it, it is more of moderate. They kind of have more moderate views on a lot of these issues, but particularly on economics, where everybody kind of had this intuition pre-Trump that the right place to be was, all right, we need to be more socially tolerant and mm-hmm. fiscally conservative. And, you know, that was kind of blown to smithereens. You know, kind of the majority of the swing voters in 2016 were people who, you know, are economically, they're kind of in that, you know, they're they're not libertarian. They're no. not even conservative or progressive. They're kind of in that populist quadrant. But if you take that old uh, political compass quiz, they you'd label them authoritarian. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. right? Uh, and that's where the votes are because I think people are just have this instinct, working class voters in particular, for we need to do something about this problem. Right. And government needs to do something. And we and need step in fewer ways it. of being in the world. So it, it, yeah. it reminds me of Ireland under Eamon de Valera, where it's they're socially conservative and fiscally socialist, or, or not yeah. socialist, but big government. I think right. one way to think about this is the ideologically constrained white college graduate conservatives who actually do have hmm. somewhat liber- at least on an yeah. economic yeah. issue, somewhat libertarian tendencies. They don't have a voting base anymore that they used yeah. to. Right. I mean, they used to be able to count on support for their type of ideas mm-hmm. among a much larger section of the electorate. And that, that has been blown to smithereens. So yeah. there's still people like that out there. There's yeah. still people yeah. who... You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Love Reason magazine and, you know, well, I'm a lot curious, of policies, but they just don't have the weight they used to. Yeah, and I'm curious if this may, um, some of it may migrate to a Democratic uh, party. I, you know, when you look at somebody like Jared Polis, who is not, who sometimes calls it Jared Polis in Colorado, who sometimes calls himself a uh, libertarian, you know, as an adjective, and he's generally free market. He's very pro free speech. He's pro school choice, mm-hmm. drug legaliz- legalization, lifestyle tolerance, et cetera. And, you know, part of the thing is if the pro business Democrat kind of disappeared for a while, um, maybe that reemerges as it seems to be dying in many ways in the Republican Party, other than the, you know, you have that weird moment of like Silicon Valley people who are backing Trump in a big way, but a lot of other Republicans don't seem to be, you know, that small business thing doesn't seem to be as big as it used to be either. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a contrary impulse, right, mm. to a lot of the things that are happening right now yeah. in the um, in the in the country. But like, I mean, you do see this rise on the on the left of the sort of this neoliberal yeah. faction, the abundance faction, as the right, Muscanian right. folks call it, and uh, and you see you see some hints of it in Harris's policies when he's yeah. talking about building new housing, um, uh, and in in some subtle shifts and change of direction of oh, I'm not mm-hmm. going to go as far on taxing unrealized capital gains yeah. and those subtle policy shifts, and in some ways bowing to the, uh, I think, her California constituency, mm-hmm. uh, venture capitalists and people she's probably been, uh, you know, mm-hmm. seeking out donations from for mo- over a decade. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, certainly I think, you know, if she wins, you know, there is some chance of a, of a subtle change in direction mm-hmm. in the party. But I'd love to hear what Rui thinks of that. I think it's, it's probably extremely subtle. And is it too subtle to really be noticed uh, by voters mm-hmm. in such a way that, you know, you'd see a, a pretty dramatic shift in voting patterns as a result of that? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think that one way to think about this, Nick, is you're unlikely mm-hmm. to get full-blown libertarianism of course. either party. But yeah, yeah. there may be elements of yeah. happening within either the parties. And this abundance agenda kind mm-hmm. of thing that's become much more popular in the Democratic Party, I'm a yeah. supporter of it myself. I mean, the idea that, in fact, you do need to make it easier to build and do stuff right. in the United States. There's excessive yeah. regulation. There's excessive difficulties with yeah. environmental reviews and permitting. 
uh, you know, if we're going to really have a dynamic economy and accomplish the goals we want to accomplish for the country economically, this cannot stand. I right. mean, we really do have to have a different yeah. approach to increase the supply of housing and the ability to uh, to build things and be a dynamic economy and get things done. So that is congenial, I think, to mm -hmm. the libertarian agenda that we are overregulated in some critical right. ways, uh, and we need to get rid of that. Yeah. So I think that there's a real possibility we'll see more of that now. Harris has talked a little bit about increasing the supply of housing and a few things that, you know, if you squint the lights dim, sound right. a little bit like the abundance agenda. But, you know, I mean, well, she's talking about an opportunity society. <laughs> the amount of change will actually economy. see if she yeah. gets into no. office. I guess yeah. I remain a bit skeptical about that because I, I don't think she has a, like a really strong commitment to it. I mean, I'm not sure what ideas she has a really strong commitment yeah. to, to be honest. So, but I do think the winds of change are are yeah. moving in that direction in the Democratic Party. I think the the feeling that all we have to do is like spend a bunch of money on the stuff that we like, and everything will yeah. turn out well. I think that's not wearing very well yeah. over time, and I think there's reaction against it. Let's uh, end by uh, making a couple of predictions or having you guys make predictions. Who's going to win the White House? Last week I would have said I'd rather I'd rather be Harris than Trump. This way, this week I'm going to say I'd rather be uh, Trump than Harris. Okay, so who's going to win though? Who's going to win? Yeah, who do you think well, will that's win? A, it's a probabilistic that's assessment. Probabilistic, I know, but I, think, but I just say I slightly. You know, I, tilt, I, tilt, I tilt it towards. Okay, Trump. well I want to okay, know why a little that bit is. Towards Trump, because why? Yeah. I mean, last week I felt yeah. the same, and maybe yeah. I kind of still feel that way this week. But it sounds yeah. like you've changed a little bit. Right? I have changed a little bit, right? right. I mean, I, I do think that uh, maybe it's the vibes that have improved a little bit, but I mm. do think she is due for a little bit of a reckoning uh, in terms mm. of, and I think that this no interviews strategy is really kind. Well, wasn't of she on Go to Your Daddy or something? Yeah, right. I mean. Well, yeah. her, She's about know. to go on Howard Stern. Right? Right. So exactly. Who knows what happens? I think it's year. probably going to start yeah. to. I think you're probably going to see some more, uh, you know, media mm -hmm. scrutiny. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you know, I, I think to me, it's don't underestimate uh, Trump in the, those red wall. Uh, sorry, not the, the, yeah. not the red wall states, though those old blue wall right. states, yeah. uh, where the polls were were pretty uh, badly off, especially in Wisconsin, but also in Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania's. The ball game, and I think after that VP debate, I think she had maybe wished yeah. she uh, picked uh, Josh Shapiro. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Who's yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I agree. I with mean, you what want Patrick Trump to win, about, but and you want <laughs> Harris to right, win. All things about, considered, about right, she should have picked Shapiro. I yeah. thought that was a terrible idea to begin with. What she did, but um, uh, yeah, I, I could sort of see that vibe shift. Hmm. I mean, I'm not sure I believe in it, or I don't know how much you believe isn't the right word, but I'm not seeing it as clearly yeah. as you do. So I guess I'm still kind of slightly leaning toward. You know, Harris will pull it out. But, I mean, it's mm -hmm. so close. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's really, really a I mean, Nate Silver's odds are what? Like 56-44, 55-45. Yeah. I mean, this really is a coin toss. Yeah. And I just, I don't have a strong feeling either yeah. way. You know, it's yeah. not like, I don't wake up on any day and think, yeah. I know Harris is going to win. What about, uh, like, what about the uh, Senate? Do you think uh, Democrats, Republican. Republican goes Republican? Oh, I think almost certainly at this point, probably. I mean, it's 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 pretty likely, but it should be like it should be a landslide, right? You know, just given yeah, yeah. Uh, the map this year that's right. all red states, right. up and they and, screwed know, up in twenty twenty two, right? Yeah, the I mean, Republicans. So you're seeing so. the benefit of uh, you know screwed up four, as many yeah. as four seats yeah. in twenty twenty two, but you it's know, not looking that way now, right? No, no. And, yeah. you know, and now you've got uh, and certainly they should be winning in a state like Arizona an open seat. They right. should be winning an open seat in Michigan, running. I mean, not quite running away Arizona. They should yeah. be running away with the others would be, you know, a coin toss. Yeah. What about the house? Hmm. I don't have strong feelings about it either way. I mean, I think the yeah. Democrats have a slight advantage, I guess, yeah. but I'm not. So what, totally would, what do you think? About I think it ultimately goes the way the White House goes. So it's okay. tilt, tilt Republican. But so it's nothing is going to have no, nothing yeah. is shaking loose this election. Like, no. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, which yeah. gets back to yeah. one of our running themes here about yeah. how the parties yeah. are at, yeah. you know, this sort yeah. of bitter, highly contested equilibrium yeah. where no one really can develop. Do you think, is advantage. that a backdrop then for a new consensus that forms, which is not necessarily partisan, but, you know, where the governing actions of the party parties are going to be kind of roughly the same. So in the, in the mm -hmm. way that, you know, progressivism kind of came in and took over both parties in the early part of the 20th century and ended a period of no decision, is a new governing philosophy, which is, okay, first off, we don't care about debt and deficits. We'll keep spending. We're going to have more tariffs. We're going to have less immigration. You know, that a new 
kind of general consensus is forming that is bigger mm-hmm. than either of the parties. I think what's certainly true is that governing increasingly has nothing to do with campaigning anymore, Mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, to the extent that these uh, policies do have some consequences. And so that's what, uh, you know, and the consequences that we're litigating right now Mm -hmm. in terms of the consequences of the immigration policies, the consequences of the spending policies, which I, uh, you know, I, I, you know, think was Trump was just as much to blame for a lot of these things as as Biden was. But uh, certainly for the uh, the, the, the consequences do have, uh, you know, actual real world implications for how people will mm-hmm. vote especially if Trump if, if Trump ends up winning right it, you mm-hmm. know it it will because of be because of the consequences of policy but in many in many ways um, the policies uh, were identical, right? The late Trump mm-hmm. policies with the early Biden policies in terms of their reaction mm-hmm. to the impulse to cut stimulus checks, the, mm-hmm. the impulse to spend trillions of dollars, yeah. right, was very, very similar. And you see, you know, a lot of Republicans also voting. I mean, at least some Republicans yeah. voting for the infrastructure bill. And right. so things mm-hmm. that, and that doesn't get talked about right. at all. On yeah, the most of the... Trump, right? New debt that Trump added to the uh, in his term came before COVID. Right. So right. it's right. you know. Yeah, I mean, I'd say more. It's a convergence of yeah. some kind rather right. than a consensus. Okay. But I, I I buy the basic idea that there's that overlap. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm very depressed, and it's <laughs> and we're recording this on a Monday. Um, final question: Are you guys surprised at how COVID has seemed to? It just doesn't seem to matter, right? What happened under COVID? Or am I misreading that? It just nobody's really talking about that very much. Hmm. I guess I'm not that surprised. Mm-hmm. I, I thought once the pandemic went away, sure. people would quickly forget about it. I am a little surprised that neither. I mean, the Democrats really have a lot of vulnerability on how they handled this, and mm-hmm. Republicans don't seem to be making much hay out of that. Uh, and I think that's interesting yeah. because I think there's still a lot of dead enders in the Democratic Party who are quite willing to defend, you know, every single thing the Democrats did around the COVID yeah. uh, pandemic. And conversely, uh, you know, they're really willing to go after Trump for like he killed a zillion people because right. he didn't move faster and better. But yeah. there doesn't seem to be a lot of appetite for it politically at this point. I mean, ask Ron DeSantis, right, how much yeah. how much directly like critiquing Trump's, uh, you know, performance yeah. during COVID mattered. I mean, and I think it's part of an instinct of, uh, you know, people don't like to look backwards. Yeah, I, th- I would yeah. say the same the thing past. is true of the 2020 election debate. And that's mm-hmm. gotten tired. That got tired real quick. January 6th, you'd think would, would have been a, a pretty right. big defining, moment, yeah, yeah, defining yeah. issue. But even that, I mean, we're right. in this hyper mode now, too, where right. the assassination attempts right. don't matter. Was there an nothing. assassination attempt? I think there were like <laughs> six or seven this morning. You know? No, but it's, it's right. kind of insane. Like we've you know reached that end point in 2001, a space odyssey, where it's just we're, you know, it's just streaming lights going by. I don't know. But we're going to leave it there. I've been talking with Rui Teixeira, the author most recently with John Judas of Where Have All the Democrats Gone? The Soul of the Party in the Age of Extremes. And Patrick Ruffini, author most recently, or this is your first book, right? Party of the People Inside the Multiracial Populist Coalition Remaking the GOP. Thanks so much for taking the time, guys. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you. 